What did you learn from John Williams? Well, he and I studied, he and I worked with the same Kempinski trio person. Bella Kempinski was a great pianist, and I felt his nuances and when he conducted, he's not a, the world's greatest conductor, but he, we did a lot of music for a while, not just his music, and I felt the nuances and everything. I said to him, hey, would you write me a concerto? So he did, long story, sh really short, and uh, I record, I played it with a couple orchestras, and that's another long story, really short. Didn't want to publish it because he says it's a stinker. So <laughs> I liked it, of course, because it was written for me. Why wouldn't I like it? You know, <laughs> but it's uh, you can you can hear it sometime. But he's a nice guy. What can I say? Who can write? He can orchestrate with one hand behind his back. But Henry Mancini can write a tune better, you know, because I grew up in Hollywood. So I know all the guys, you know, just ask me about any of them. Or I used to do the studio work with them. Did Luciano Berio write the Brahms sonatas for orchestra for you? Okay, this is that's also a funny story. I kept on waiting for this concerto that was supposed to be written for me. It didn't happen. And and so I said, you know, in Yiddish, no, so where is it already? And so I was the, the, the orchestra paid for that. It's basically you get the masterworks, Brahms first and second sonatas, and you put them on your stand. And you wait instead of the, the pianist goes da -dee da 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 -dee da da da. Not all Berio did was make a sort of like a Nino Rota like opening that was like wonderful, like Cinema Paradiso. I mean, I just felt like I was in Italy, and Brahms was in Italy for about 23 measures, and wonderful. And then, so all I did is just play the Brahms first sonata. That was it, baby. But here's the bitch of it, okay? Bad, bad thing about it, okay? I needed a microphone because you're in your throat notes. So you're having to go dee da da dee da like blast through 110 players instead of a piano. So that sucked, you know? <laughs> Later on, I guess I figured you better get a microphone. But it, and Barrio was there, you know, smoking, sitting in the audience, and very strange fellow, strange, as far as I could see. That's it. How was working with Stravinsky? Incredible, incredible. He conducted uh, all his works, basically, Petrushka, you know, everything. And he had an energy, he was a little guy. And little guys that are under five, six, I have this theory, they're just, they have energy that we can't ever duplicate. I'm 5'4", but I'm a woman, so I can't duplicate that either. But it's just like, and when you do Petrushka, the rhythm was so, you could just, it was like a, you could just feel the rhythm. You don't even have to do the counting. He did it for you. And he would just go like that. And he was just an amazing conductor. And uh, sometimes we know all know the story about Stravinsky, right? Um, you know, he liked his vodka too. So Robert Kraft, when we were recording a lot of stuff, they were running out of time and he had to go to the bathroom to have his vodka, you know. So <laughs> Robert, some of this, the stuff, some of the music that was um, performed for Capitol Records uh, was actually Robert Kraft conducting. But he was, uh, Stravinsky was the best. He was just, phenomenal. my dad played the three pieces for him and, uh, Says, come in, Mr. Block, you know. I was I'm sorry I'm not wasn't there. So he did he played through the whole piece. My father's way more talented than me. I don't think I could have done that in front of Stravinsky. I just would go <laughs> But anyway, so <laughs> so after the first movement, it goes, Stravinsky gets a piano a pe pencil and he writes on the part, piano. But on at the very end of the first movement, he says, I should have put a piano in there, darn or whatever they say in uh, Russian. So he just, it's, he wrote it in later. He says, wonderful, Mr. Block, wonderful. So very nice man. And I used to go to his house because we were recording Schoenberg, all the septet and the octet. And uh, he let us use our house because Robert Kraft was conducting. Maybe Robert Kraft even stayed there or something, but he was like his amanuensis, his, his help. How was playing Copland Concerto with himself conducting? He scared me. He didn't look like he was such a nice guy. Man, I better practice this concerto. 
So I practiced it. I not only practiced it for a year, on the German system, it doesn't sound very good. There's a couple of pieces that sound terrible on the German system. Premier Rhapsody and the Copeland Con the Clarinet Concerto. Doesn't sound, it sounds too thoughtful. There's too much meaning, you know, so. But anyway, I practiced to try to get the meaning out of the concerto, you know, and uh, I had it, I played it at a clarinet convention before I was to play it with the Hollywood Bowl with Copeland. So what happened is nothing. He conducted, I played, we never even stopped, went through it once and I played the concert. Cause he was, he says, that's the most solid playing of this concerto I ever heard. But do you want to hear the greatest interpretation of that concerto? It's Stoltzman with Michael Tilson Thomas. It's an audio and I just, I heard that and I went, oh my God. Try to see if you can get it. It's like awesome. I'm not that humble. You know, I think I'm great, but this was seriously incredible. Is the situation of female performers different than when you started? I was unmarried. I was single. I was 18. So I had to kind of beat them off with sticks, you know, like, go away, go away, go away. It's just, and uh, they, I wasn't accepted right away, no question. And after touring the orchestra five years later on a world tour, one of the vi grumpy violinists came up to me and said, huh. It sounds good. I didn't think you would be good, but you got really good, Missy. <laughs> I had to prove myself a little like over and over. I didn't think about it <clears throat> because I'm, I'm this kind of a person that lives in their own world. So I just, people, I don't, I don't even listen to the people around me, especially if they were bad in the orchestra. I just played and that was it. It's terrible. What qualities do you appreciate in good musicians? I appreciate that they know the style of each composer, and it makes me angry if they don't. Just a little of the style, you know. And it's not, I appreciate that they don't play everything the same way, you know. You have to know the story of the musician, you have to know all his hang-ups, and you have to know everything about the man who wrote the music. So that's, that's what I, how I always approach the music like that but not I'm not a clarinet jock that way oh well, I could be I mean actually oh, who isn't you have to be a clarinet jock to you know what reed should I play what mouthpiece should I play but I did the weird thing though I changed to German system in 1972 that's the weird thing that was the best move I ever made how did you end up playing German system in the U.S.? Well, my husband, Charles, was also, he studied with Yettel in Vienna, Rudolf Yettel. And we had our teachers' teachers, both of them played German system. So Lindemann was first clarinet in the Chicago Symphony. He's taught my husband's father, but he taught him French. So we had that German kind of sound, but not like how we had that old kind of German Viennese sound. We didn't like that bright cuckoo clock sound. We liked that heavy Harley being able to hear one note from another so dark that, you know, we went, went crazy with that. But so we have that in our background. So I had that. So I, I had Bellison's. See, I couldn't get as good a sound as my father, naturally. This is the truth. That guy had a tone. You know, how, you ever meet a person, he picks up the clarinet, it just sounds amazing and it has its own tone and life. And, you know, birds are flying and insects are looking with their antenna. That's like so great. I don't have that. <laughs> I just have a new neutral sound. So I needed a clarinet to give me kind of a center of tone and I, without working too hard, I didn't want to bite. So, oh, okay, I'll play for German then. It was just, that's what I ended up with. Hard to do. I had to use all the play. I my, I wanted, I taught, I made, to, I actually had to practice because I didn't want to screw up in public, you know. That was hard. It's hard, technically harder. A funny story that you can share with us? When I first joined the orchestra and I had to do the Liszt Piano Concerto, I'm all set to go, right? Clarinet's not working. You know that story, right? So why would you know that story? So my father puts a dime in between the upper and lower joint. That's what he did. I looked at the clarinet. You put a dime in there, you know? So I got even actually. So he had to play, uh, I don't know, Scheherazade. And I, you know that plastic film you put over, over food so it doesn't go bad in the fridge? It's clear. So I put a clear one between the top and the lower joint. Plus, just to make sure that he wouldn't look there, I had some old pads that I threw on the floor planet pads. So that was like, I got him, man. I got him, <laughs> I got him good. 
any advice for the clarinetistas del futuro? When you're not practicing, somebody else is, you know, you got to practice, but you can't practice wrong, number one. And number two, stop your practice session when you sound the best. Don't just put in time, put in quality, the quality time. I practiced four hours. Yeah, you know, really? You know, people say, yeah, I practiced eight hours. You didn't. You've been brain dead, brain dead for six hours of that eight hours. So don't do it, you know. It's not lay, like laying railroad ties, you know, to, you know, Timbuktu. You gotta, you gotta practice intelligently. And then you do the warm up sort of, to, you know, get you going. It's like a mantra. Everybody has their own warm up.